Hello, everybody, and welcome. It is just five o'clock in Eastern Time, um, United States tonight. And I know there's a lot of people that are coming on the event still and, and joining us, but I'll just start talking because um, my part is not as memorable as what's going to happen when the tour director joins us. So I just want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, as most of you know by now, my name is Mara Walsh, and I'm your host today. I'm so glad to see everyone again. You know, I took a week or so off for the American holiday of Thanksgiving, and I feel like I've been away from the virtual world for a really long time. So I'm happy to see everybody. Welcome back. And it's nice to be virtual with you again. First, a few housekeeping items. If um, I'm going to deal with audio first. If you need to turn up your audio, you can do this in three different ways. One, you can attach a headset or earbuds. That is by far the best way to listen. Uh, it's the clearest and best um, best volume. If you don't have that and, and you don't and you'd prefer another way, you can turn up your computer volume. Um, you can also go to the little arrow next to your microphone button on Zoom, which allows you to change your audio settings. Your screen, to enlarge the presentation part of your screen, you see me on one side and it's a very small piece of video and then you see the slide. You can shift the vertical toolbar between my video and the screen so it's closer to me, which allows you to see the presentation in a larger mode. If you're on an iPhone or an iPad or another device, you may have to swipe left or right to see the presentation and forego the video of the person speaking. Okay, now we should all be optimized for the best viewing results. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself and how we got started in this virtual tour world. Um, again, I'm Mara Walsh. I'm in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York. I started leading physical tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader. Uh, I, take I, I take groups of girls and their families to international destinations every summer. I have since expanded my physical travel program. I've added adult only tours as well as family friendly tours through the uh, Go Ahead Tours partner, which is an EF Tour division. There's a couple reasons I started the virtual tour series. One, I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of travel restrictions where they have not been able to work for a very long time. And two, I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and to extend that opportunity to those of you out there who have learned about us through social media, your family, your friends, and other people. We've done several tours in the past months. If you've missed them, all of them are recorded and they are um, on my website. The page that you can see them on is girltraveltours.com slash virtual, I'm sorry, slash virtual tours. I'm actually trying to share a screen which shows you the upcoming virtual tours. Um, you can see that we have many tours coming up. Uh, Berlin, the Canadian Rockies, Gaudi's Barcelona, Amsterdam, Florence and Tuscany. We have a World War II and Western Front, Scandinavia, Notable Women of Santa Fe, Mystery on the Orient Express, uh, Northern Ireland and its Troubles, uh, Iceland, and so much more that are coming in the future. As long as you're interested in viewing these tours, we'll continue to produce them. I have a slew of tour director friends from all over the world, and they've been so kind to jump in and share their knowledge and their love for their, their lands with all of you. Um, you can register for future tours through my website. You can also view them on Facebook. We're going to um, share a few ways for you to interact with us tonight. For those of you in Zoom, you can interact with me through the chat that is not shared with anybody else on the on the event and I will try to get to your questions as soon as possible. You can also enter questions in the Q&A portion of the Zoom toolbar. Those questions will be handled by Raffaele at the end of the tour and um, we'll, share, we'll share that information with you. If you're on Facebook, you can continue to use the, the comments um, section and I'll try to monitor those as well. Okay, so I always like to put a little interactive poll up 
for the people in um, in Zoom, and then for the Facebook people, you can just add it in the comments. But the the question is, what's your connection to Vienna? Um, I've been and I love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future. I'm not sure. You know, I, I don't have a trip, but I I would love to to explore it in the future. Or I'm solely here to travel virtually, and I want to experience it virtually. So I'm going to give you a second as we tally those votes. Uh, and again, you know, in Facebook land, you can share your opinion as well. It's actually really big, um, a big percentage of people who've been to Vienna. I'm seeing about 34% or so that of people have been there. Um, we have a lot of people who are planning to go in the future. And then I, I, I applaud all of you out there in the virtual land who are experiencing it virtually and really just keep coming back week after week for our virtual tour. So thank you. I'm going to share the results there. And as you see them, I'm going to stop sharing. OK, so we're going to move on in the presentation here. A tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal concierge who stays with the group from start to finish. The minute you land and the, till the minute you go home, this, this person, in this case, this, this gentleman uh, manages your tour plans uh, to make sure that your experience is stressless and full of positive experiences. They are always three steps ahead of you on tour and booking what you're going to be doing the next day. So it's an amazing, it's amazing relationship and I really do value the, the, um, the, the work and knowledge of a tour director. These are by far the most important people in the group and we're not traveling at all this year, so you can imagine our tour directors are not working. Okay, so all of the, um, because we're, we're doing this for the tour directors, I will put in the Q&A a way for you to tip. This tour is free for you to attend, but if you choose to tip the tour director, we will provide you with a way to do that in the Q&A and the chat. Um, my website also has a link to tip. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, all of the tips go directly to the tour director once collected, minus the Zoom fees. I'm hoping that this virtual tour will not only reignite your desire to travel, but also allow a tour director to do what he does best and share his knowledge and passion for travel. But before I hand it over to this great tour director, I know many of you found my virtual tours through Facebook. I just wanna stop for a minute and warn anybody on Facebook who is attending virtual tours, please do not give your credit card information, whether it's just to hold it or take a payment for a virtual tour on Facebook. There are many, many fake copycat scammers out there that are taking legitimate virtual tours and pages and copying them and trying to lure people in to provide credit card details. Please do not fall for it, okay? If you want to safely access my tours, you can always go to my website, which is girltraveltours.com. All right, enough of that. Let's get back to our virtual tour. Today, we're lucky to have a tour director who loves the city of Vienna so much that he's adopted it as his own. I am honored today to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director, Raffaele Marmo. Raffaele, I'm going to stop sharing and you can take over the share and start your presentation. Hello, everybody. Hi. Guten Abend aus Wien. Uh, good evening from Vienna. Uh, my name is uh, Raffaele. I am uh, 38 years old, and I'm originally from Italy, but I moved uh, uh, to Vienna about 17 years ago. So Vienna became my chosen hometown, and I'm extremely excited to be able tonight to, to show you around uh, this gorgeous city. So thank you, Mara, for this uh, opportunity. And uh, I am going to share now my uh, presentation. So you will, we can start. Here we are. Um, this is uh, uh, a picture I found on, uh, in the, on the internet. And uh, uh, of course, it's not a real landscape of Vienna, but uh, you can uh, see the, most of the landmarks uh, that you can find here in town. Um, so mo many of them, we will see them uh, on, uh, on our tour. And uh, before we start talking, or I start talking uh, about uh, Vienna, uh, I will uh, uh, talk a little bit about Austria. First of all, where is Austria? 
Austria. Here you can see a European map uh, and uh, Austria is quite a central country, not uh, that big. Um, and it has quite a lot of uh, neighbors. Let's start with my home country, Italy in the south. Uh, we have then uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein. We have Germany, uh, Czech Republic. Then we have Slovakia, uh, Hungary, and last but not least, Slovenia. So seven neighbors uh, around uh, Austria. And as I, as I mentioned, Austria is a rather small country. Altogether, there are not even 9 million uh, inhabitants. Uh, and uh, basically 1.9 million are living in uh, Indiana in the capital city. So it's, uh, there are not that many Austrian uh, uh, around, let's say. But, uh, uh, and here you have also the Austrian flag. Uh, that's the uh, red, white, red uh, uh, striped uh, flag. Um, if we look at Austria, so how, do, how does Austria look like? Uh, here we have uh, a geographical map of the country. I guess you can see my mouse also. Um, you can see most of the, of the country is actually covered with mountains. These are uh, part of the Alps. Um, and the Alps goes basically towards Vienna here in the upper part, in the eastern part. And here you can also see and read the, uh, the German, uh, um, the German uh, uh, name of Vienna, which is called Wien, W-I-E-N. And uh, the tallest mountain in uh, uh, Austria is the Grossglockner, which is uh, uh, roughly 12,400 uh, 12, feet. And uh, uh, the, uh, there is another very important uh, uh, geographical element, let's, let's call it like that, which is the river. And uh, here you have it, it's the Danube. And the Danube is the Europe's second uh, longest river. And uh, it flows through, through 10 countries. So it starts in Germany and it goes uh, to the Black Sea. And uh, as you can see, it's flowing also through uh, Vienna. And uh, in, in the past, uh, especially during the uh, Roman time, um, the Roman Empire, the Danube has been very important because it was a natural border to the Roman Empire. So uh, many cities were also uh, founded by uh, the Romans and as well uh, Vienna. We will talk a little bit more later on. And uh, uh, now that you can, uh, you saw more or less where it is, uh, uh, where it is and how it looks like on a map. Here there are, uh, I, I took some uh, pictures of how uh, the Austrian landscape looks like. Um, as you can see, it's, uh, it's a gorgeous landscape. Well, there are beautiful mountains, uh, lakes, uh, uh, little towns. Uh, it's, uh, there is also, they have great wines, wine hills you can see on the top uh, uh, left uh, of the screen. And so it's the perfect place if you are into winter holidays or hiking, you have to come to Austria, it's, uh, it's amazing. And, uh, uh, of course, most of you, if not everybody, connect Austria to this movie, which is The Sound of Music from 1965 with Julie Andrews. And uh, as you can see, you can compare the, uh, the pictures. The landscape is quite, uh, quite uh, accurate, quite similar. They did some mistake in the geography in the movie, but it's another story. <laughs> and uh, so it's like this is how uh, most of Austria basically looks like. And now that you have seen how Austria look like, uh, look like we, I can tell you something. There are no kangaroos in Austria. And this is, uh, may sound a bit silly, but uh, trust me, a lot of people, especially people not from Europe, they tend to mix up Austria and uh, uh, Australia. So this is a souvenir you can find in Vienna. It's, there are plenty of them on t-shirts, on uh, uh, postcards and everything. So there are no kangaroos. There are, there are only kangaroos in the zoo and we will see it later on also. <laughs> so, and um, yes, here we go on. Austria is a very uh, rich country. Uh, it has a lot of uh, industries, a lot of services. I tried to, I picked three uh, products which are uh, worldwide famous and uh, you might don't know that they are from uh, uh, coming from here. So here we are. The first one is Red Bull. 
uh, Red Bull is it comes from the from Salzburg, from another city in uh, in Austria. Then we have the Swarovski, the crystals, uh, which uh, it's a very old, very important company, uh, which is based in Tyrol, um, at the, in the western part uh, of uh, of Austria. And last but not least, the, the this candy dispenser, which are uh, worldwide famous actually and very colorful a uh, lot of like uh, uh, cartoon characters and they are from Vienna it's a company that was founded here in uh, in Vienna and uh, of course not only products uh, are famous uh, Austrian products are famous around the world but of course also Austrian people and here we have uh, a selection I try to to find uh, to put together some of them. And you can see, starting from uh, classical music, so we have uh, uh, people such as uh, Wolf Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart or uh, Josef Haydn, as well as uh, Johann Strauss II, which was the composer uh, of the music at the very beginning of this presentation of this Zoom. Uh, then we have uh, Sigmund Freud and his daughter Anna. They were both uh, uh, very important in the psychoanalysis. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, also uh, painters um, um, like uh, Gustav Klimt, actress uh, such as Romy Schneider, Formula One racer, Niki Lauda. And then we go on to the more contemporary um, Austrians, such as, for example, Christoph Waltz, also an actor, and Conchita Wurz, which who is maybe not that famous in the US, but uh, she won the biggest European uh, music festival, the Eurovision a couple of years ago. So she is a big pop star here. And of course, last but not least, we have Arnold. And this is, uh, <laughs> this is not a, a recent picture of him. This is the more uh, uh, iconic picture of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, he doesn't look like this anymore, uh, but uh, he's, uh, we can say that he's definitely the most famous Austrian people, definitely, uh, especially also in the US, in the States. And um, yes, and if we talk about, uh, uh, about famous Austrian people, we have to uh, to mention also a very important fam uh, family dynasty, the Habsburgs. You might have heard about them, uh, but I will, uh, or if you didn't, uh, I will try to keep it simple because it's uh, the Habsburgs are a very incredib incredibly important uh, uh, dynasty in the European history. And here you have uh, a little overview how many years, how long the House of Habsburg have been uh, ruling basically uh, over parts of, uh, of Europe. So starting at the end of the 13th century and going until the 1918, which is the end of the First World War. Uh, after, the, uh, after the First World War, the Habsburg, the, uh, they had to leave Austria and they kind of basically lose their power. Here you have also the coat of arms of the House Habsburg. But uh, to make uh, things even more complicated, um, we have to, I have to tell you also that uh, the Habsburgs were not only ruling over their own territories, as uh, they were archdukes basically over territories here, but they have been for about um, 400, uh, uh, 350 years more or less, also emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was a uh, very important, very powerful empire that was uh, founded uh, by Charlemagne in the, in the year basically 800. And uh, uh, it was covering parts of uh, France, Germany, Czech Republic, uh, uh, Austria, so Italy. So it was kind of like a very, very big um, territory. And the Habsburg have been uh, uh, emperors uh, for many years until the end of the uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, this uh, the end happened thanks to a person, a very famous one, Napoleon Bonaparte, and uh, in the 1806 he uh, put an end to the Holy Roman Empire, and. Two years before this end, the Habsburg, uh, the House of Habsburg decided to create their own empire, which is the so-called Austrian Empire. Here you have also another coat of arms of the, of the Austrian Empire. And this Austrian Empire in the, in the second half of the 19th century was turned into the so-called 
Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's a bit like uh, many things happened, and uh, but basically uh, this also uh, was uh, stopped existing uh, with the First World War when Austria became a republic. And uh, to give you an idea, because now we watched, you saw only numbers, uh, to give you an idea how uh, big these territories were, here you have, uh, I, I found these uh, screenshots that are very uh, good to understand a little bit. This is, uh, um, this is at the end of the 13th century when the House of Habsburg so officially started existing. And uh, you can see the territories where they started is basically the modern uh, Switzerland. And the first Habsburg was the uh, Rudolf the first Rudolf of Habsburg. And here to, on the right, you can see also the Habsburg castle, which is still there. It doesn't belong anymore to the Habsburg family, but you can still visit if you go to Switzerland. And uh, it's very nice and it's even for free. So which is in Switzerland, not that common. And, uh, and now you can see how over the years, their power kind of like moved towards the, the East. And uh, now, you can see also that slowly they spread also towards, for example, the Netherlands. And this happened because uh, thanks actually to Maximilian I, who was an emperor from the Habsburg, who married this Mary of Burgundy. It's just an example because uh, uh, it's interesting to say that the Habsburg didn't like too much to make war basically. They prefer to, uh, to conquer territories through uh, planned weddings. And this is basically also what happened here. And, uh, and as you can see through this, they were able also at the beginning of the 16th century to, uh, to, get, to get connection, to get the control over uh, Spain. And uh, also with Philip the Handsome, uh, who was the first Habsburg in the Spanish uh, house. Uh, he was the handsome, but maybe he didn't look really the handsome, <laughs> the, the most handsome one. But the Habsburg were not very famous for being are the most beautiful ones, but uh, still, they thanks to him and thanks to this uh, policy, wedding policy, they were uh, able to, uh, especially then uh, with uh, his son Charles V, to, to rule basically all over the world. Because uh, uh, thanks to Spain, they, it was the period of the uh, colonies, colonization, so the New World, and uh, there, uh, uh, for example, Charles V. Uh, it said that its, uh, its empire was uh, uh, an empire where the sun never uh, sat down. So it was from Eastern Asia towards the Americas. So it was really like a worldwide power. And um, here you can see it's just uh, uh, also like a little uh, information. They, uh, they had a lot of sons, they had a lot of, uh, they, they, they also this, in order to divide uh, this power, they, they gave it to the different uh, sons. Here you have the Philip II of Spain, uh, the son of Charles V, who took over the Spanish line. And uh, Ferdinand I was the one that then took over the Austrian. So just like a lot of names, but it's just to give you an idea how this uh, spread and, uh, and developed. Uh, the Spanish line disappeared. Uh, slowly, but uh, the Austrian line was the one that survived and became very, you know, very powerful. You can see a lot of changes uh, over the years. Here you have uh, uh, the uh, last Roman, uh, Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, if you remember, I mentioned that in uh, 1806, Napoleon put an end to the Holy Roman Empire and uh, Francis was uh, the second or the first. Um, uh, the, he was the, uh, the Habsburg who was em emperor at the, at the time, and who, he was also the one who created then the Austrian Empire, which uh, this is Napoleon Bonaparte, as uh, we mentioned before. And uh, this, whole, this Austrian Empire, this is uh, grow up and, and became quite uh, uh, powerful after the, the end of the Napoleon uh, era. And uh, Franz Josef I, was the most uh, famous, most beloved uh, emperor during the 19th century. We will talk a little bit more about him in a while. And here you have the last Austrian emperor, Charles I, who uh, was then sent in exile at the end of the First World War. 
And here is how Austria looks like now. Of course, then during uh, the Second World War, uh, it got also uh, under, it became part of the Nazi Germany, but basically then uh, it stayed like it is uh, now. And this is again how it looks like. Uh, here we can see the, uh, the different regions or district of Austria. We have uh, Vienna, the capital city, which is here uh, in, the, in the eastern part. And then uh, going down from bigger to uh, smaller towns, we have uh, Styria with Graz, where uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. Uh, then we have uh, Linz, uh, so Upper Austria. We have Salzburg, beautiful city uh, to visit. We have uh, also Tyrol, Innsbruck, uh, and it's great for winter holidays. Uh, we have in the south, we have Carinthia, around Vienna, the lower Austria. Then we have in the very west, uh, for Alberg with Bregenz. And last but not least, in the east, we have Burgenland. So nine, nine region. And, uh, and now we, I think we are ready to go uh, to Vienna, to the capital city. And here we are. This is like uh, how, um, how Vienna looks like. Uh, it is divided in uh, 23 districts, um, more or less in a, uh, from, uh, from the very center towards, in a circles towards the outskirts, more or less. Uh, and here you have the Danube, how it, uh, uh, where it is now. Uh, it is uh, not really inside the, the, or next to the old town. Uh, it's a bit uh, on the outside, but there is still uh, uh, an arm of the, 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 of the river, which is uh, uh, really next to the, to the old town. And this is the uh, Danube uh, Channel, the Danube Canal. And this is the number one, the district number one is uh, the very, very center. And this is also where we start our uh, exploration. And uh, here we are in the old town. The old town looks uh, kind of like this. <laughs> As you can see, there are a lot of monuments, a lot of buildings, uh, landmarks. Um, but uh, to give you again some, uh, some references here, you have the Danube Canal. Uh, here you have the so-called Ring Road, uh, which is uh, not properly a, a, a circle, a ring, but it's more like a U-shaped. And it is a boulevard, who, a big, uh, very elegant street, uh, which uh, runs uh, around uh, the old town. And alongside this, uh, this, this road, you have most of the, uh, the most important, actually, many of the most important uh, buildings, such as the university, you have the town hall, the parliament, the uh, natural muse history museum, and as well the museum of art history. Uh, we have the state opera, city park, uh, and the uh, university of applied arts and uh, also the Imperial Palace, the so-called Hofburg. But the very, very center is definitely the St. Stephen's Cathedral, which looks like this. It's an impressive Gothic masterpiece. It is uh, uh, one of the most important churches, Gothic churches uh, in the north of the Alps. And uh, uh, it has a very long history. And uh, um, it is, uh, uh, if you look at the landscape in Vienna, this is uh, the, 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 the tower of the St. Stephen Cathedral is, the, is definitely uh, the most eye-catching uh, building. Um, the history of this, uh, of this cathedral uh, goes back to the uh, 12th century when uh, the first church was built. Uh, after 100 years, uh, because of the fire was, this, this was this destroyed and um, in the 13th century they rebuilt it um, and it was of course bigger and this construction went on and on. But uh, uh, this, uh, um, just to go back to the, uh, to the landscape, here you have, um, here you have a, a, a drawing of Vienna in the 16th century. And here you can still see, it's very interesting because you can see the, how Vienna was basically very small in a way. You can still see the city walls uh, surrounding the, the town. And of course, you see the biggest uh, building, the tallest one is the, St. Stephen Cathedral. And this, this tower was not only the cathedral tower, but it was on, also a place from where uh, Viennese people can, uh, could, um, could check and watch what was happening, for example, uh, outside the city walls. Um, back then it was uh, not always a peaceful time. 
and especially uh, in the 16th and 17th century, uh, Vienna uh, was uh, uh, was victim of like the twice the Ottoman Empire tried to conquer the city. One time in the um, in the uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the 16th century and the second one in uh, the 1683 both times they didn't manage to conquer the city so it was kind of like a very important success for europe because europe was able to kind of like uh, uh, keep on developing how uh, it uh, until now how it is now and um and here you have a better a better picture of uh, of the south tower, which is the tallest tower of the of the cathedral. And uh, this tower was finished in the at the beginning in the fourteen thirty three. As you can see, it's a gothic uh, uh, tower. You can uh, see many gothic elements, the pointed arches, uh, uh, all this uh, very very tall uh, uh, building. And um, and uh, uh, it's not the only tower that uh, uh, has the, that the Saint Stephen Cathedral has, because right on the other side there is also the North Tower. Uh, the North Tower was supposed to, to be exactly uh, the same as the other one, but uh, as you can see, they kind of like changed their plans. <laughs> so uh, first of all, if you check the, the, the year, it was uh, uh, about 140 years later was finished. And so the Gothic was already this period, architectural uh, style was basically at the end. So they kind of like, uh, um, it was not really like uh, fitting anymore to keep on uh, building in that uh, style. And it was also, uh, of course, a matter of so financial matter because to build a cathedral, you need a lot of money, uh, especially back then. So they decided to finish this, uh, this tower with, uh, a, with a little uh, roof, uh, which is in a totally different style, in a Renaissance style. And uh, it's called also by the Viennese in a lovely way, the little water tank, or <laughs> let's say something, you know, I can translate it like that. And although this tower is uh, way, uh, way shorter compared to the, uh, to the 446 feet of the South Tower, there is inside something quite special. And this is like this. I guess you can hear. I hope. <laughs> and yes, this is uh, uh, what you heard is uh, Isabel, <laughs> and uh, this is uh, this uh, this bell, uh, the uh, so-called pumerin. Uh, the pumerin is uh, uh, a very a uh, very famous uh, bell in uh, Austria is the largest free uh, the, the largest freestanding uh, uh, bell. It was uh, it was uh, created melting about two hundred cannons left by the Ottoman uh, troops uh, in uh, uh, by the second attempt to conquer Vienna and uh, and by now is the third uh, uh, is the third uh, largest uh, freestanding bell in uh, in Europe. So it's uh, it's really like uh, um, a very uh, a very big one, and uh, it is uh, uh, about forty-four thousand uh, pounds. So you can imagine, quite, it's quite impressive. And in the in the front of the uh, of the of the church, you have the uh, two other towers, which is this is the main entrance, and. Uh, uh, these two towers or this facade is uh, the oldest part of the of the church because it belongs still to the first uh, building that was built back in the 12th century. So uh, not everything was destroyed by the fire. They uh, integrated these uh, these, uh, these these two towers and the entrance uh, in the um, in the inside the building. So this is like uh, you can see the cathedral is like a mix of three different uh, styles at the end. Uh, another very, very important uh, or very eye-catching uh, uh, element of the church is the, uh, is the roof. Uh, this is uh, uh, a picture. Uh, it's, a, it's made out of about 230,000 uh, colored uh, tiles. Uh, it's uh, especially when the sun is shining. In Vienna, it's kind of like not always shining, but if the sun is shining, the effect is amazing. The, colorful, the colors are great. 
And uh, here you have another picture from, uh, from uh, the, another part of the roof. And uh, what you can see here is uh, uh, the, uh, you can see the coat of arms of the Habsburg, which is like this uh, uh, double headed eagle. And on the other side here, you can see two more uh, coat of arms, which are uh, the one of, uh, of uh, Vienna, of the city of Vienna, and the one of the Republic of Austria. So the Republic of Austria is, uh, is uh, an institution, or like uh, the Republic was uh, it's quite uh, young. It was uh, created uh, or it was born basically in the, uh, after the First World War. So uh, you might ask yourself, how did they manage to put the coat of arms there uh, if the church is so old? This, the answer is because the, in, uh, in the, uh, right at the end of the Second World War, the cathedral was destroyed by a fire, so the roof collapsed. Uh, and they took many years to rebuild everything, but uh, uh, this is when basically they decided to add some uh, uh, more contemporary elements in the, in the design. And uh, now we will move inside and to the inside, and here we go. Um, here you have the a view of this uh, uh, of the cathedral. The, the space is amazing. It's like a perfect Gothic uh, space. You can see these uh, very high uh, vaults, very high columns. Um, there are many many altars, many chapels uh, inside the church. This is the main altar, which is dedicated to Saint Stephen. Saint Stephen uh, was uh, uh, the first martyr in the uh, Christian. In history, and this is uh, um, this is just one example of uh, you can spend uh, hours inside just walking around. And here you have some more impressions, also of the columns of the roof. Here is a view towards the uh, the entrance. And, uh, uh, and if you come to Vienna, I saw that many people want to come to Vienna. This is very nice. Uh, if you come, I really, really suggest you to book also a tour of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of what's behind, as well behind, sorry, <laughs> under the cathedral. And this is, uh, these are the catacombs. Here you have some pictures, um, a bit spookier. Uh, the, the, the catacombs un uh, under the St. Stephen Cathedral, uh, there are inside about uh, 10, 11,000 more or less uh, uh, people are buried there. So a lot of people, uh, not only common people, but there is also a very special uh, um, chapel there, which is the Archduke's chapel where also, uh, some of the Habsburgs and as well, but most of them, parts of the Habsburgs are also uh, buried there inside urns. It was common back then to uh, when a very important or noble person from especially from the house of the Habsburgs died, not to bury him in one uh, coffin, but to kind of like put the heart and the, in the organs and his body in different places. So they're a bit spread all over, uh, all over uh, Vienna, among many of them. So, but I really suggest you to go, you need to book a guide, but it's, uh, it's really worth it of doing that. So not far away from, uh, from the Hofburg, we have the um, the uh, sorry, not far away from the from the <laughs> Saint Stephen Cathedral, we, Cathedral. We have the Hofburg, the Imperial Palace. It is more or less ten minutes walk, so really like not far away. And this is how it looks uh, from above. Uh, it's a huge complex. Um, here there are like. Uh, basically the, 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 how big it is. Um, there are many things, many buildings inside. It's like uh, here there are some uh, facts. You have uh, like uh, 18 wings, 19 courtyards, 2,600 rooms. So imagine how many windows you know, they had to clean. It's just crazy. And uh, still now there are like about 5,000 people uh, living or working inside. So it's, uh, it's, ba it's basically the center of the power uh, here in Vienna, here in Austria, uh, since uh, many centuries, since 600 more, 650 years, kind of less, more or less. So it has a very long history, very important. But if you look at this uh, huge complex, uh, uh, you have also to think that everything started basically here. And this is how it looked. 
uh, the castle in the 13th century, uh, the, the Hofburg started as a medieval castle, and uh, uh, it, uh, of course, it was changed over the over the centuries. Um, it uh, also now you don't have these towers anymore. You don't have the moat. It, everything was was uh, was changed. Uh, each emperor and each king, or so they they kind of like gave their personal touch to their palace. So you can imagine how many things. Uh, changed, but uh, uh, this is how it looks now. One of the main entrance to the to the to the Swiss wing, uh, which is called like that, by the way, because the Swiss guards were there, like uh, protecting uh, protecting the, uh, the, the, the 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 family. There. Um, and uh, uh, what you find inside is uh, there is something very special, very unique, and it is the imperial treasury which is uh, one of the most beautiful collection worldwide of, uh, of uh, jewels, of crowns, of uh, presents that uh, the Habsburg di family dynasty collected over the, over the years. So it's really like worth of, uh, if you like bling bling, <laughs> it's the place to, 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 to see if you come to Vienna. But let's go back to the, uh, let's go back to what you see coming from the St. Stephen Cathedral. This is the first square basically you meet coming from the, from the cathedral. And this square is the, the so-called St. Michael uh, Square. Uh, it's a beautiful, a very interesting uh, place for me because uh, uh, in, it's not a big square, but it connect, it uh, collects a lot of different uh, uh, buildings and uh, um, elements full of history. So what you see here is the wing of the palace, of the imperial palace which uh, uh, is one of the main entrance also to the to the palace and uh, right in front of it and the uh, very other side of the opposite side of the of the of the square you have the saint michael church which uh, where the the square uh, takes the name and this is one of the oldest uh, uh, churches in uh, here in vienna it dates back to the year 1221 so it's really like we're talking about 800 year uh, history here. And uh, another part that you can already here see on this picture is these, uh, these are excavations. Uh, these excavations were, uh, were done a couple of years ago while they tr were trying to build a new um, subway station. And uh, these are Roman ruins. As uh, I mentioned at the beginning, Vienna, as many other cities here in Europe, was founded also by the Romans. Uh, this, the city of Vienna, the settlement here was founded in the year 15 after Christ. And uh, the name was not Vienna, but was Vindobona. And since then, um, it's kept on uh, being growing and uh, also in importance. So it's, it's very fascinating to think how also small a town uh, started. Um, and another uh, building which is on, this, uh, on the same square is this one. It's the so-called Los House. Uh, which might not look that uh, interesting compared maybe to other to the to the beauty of this imperial palace, but uh, it is uh, especially if you are a bit more into architecture, it is one of the most important example of the first uh, modern architecture. We're talking about uh, 90, the year 1911, and you can imagine also back then how uh, such a how um, brave it was for the architect to build such a modern building in front of the emperor house so it's it's I always like these uh, these neighbors and what do you find inside so there are many things you can uh, you can do uh, inside uh, as a tourist especially inside the uh, inside the Hofburg first of all here on the here you have the so-called Spanish riding school uh, it's a unique uh, riding school there are four of the, this kind in uh, in the world and this is the oldest one dates back to the end of the 16th century. And uh, it is, uh, there are right now 68 uh, white uh, stallion from uh, of the, um, of the Lipizzan horses. Uh, they were used back then as they were the private imperial uh, horses. Uh, but now they do this, uh, and this beautiful uh, show, which is a mix of dressage and uh, with the classical music, and you can watch it. And here, I a special show. 
And back to the palace. Here you have something else that you can visit if you come uh, if you come uh, to Vienna. And these are the imperial apartments. And inside you can find, uh, first of all, you can find the imperial silver collection, which is also an amazing collection of all the silverware uh, that was belonging to the to the fam to the Habsburgs. But as well also the so-called CC Museum. Here you have some picture of the of the museum, and uh, it's uh, it's the best way to get uh, a view or to get a bit more of understanding about uh, uh, the uh, first of all the, the person of Sisi and all uh, the in the 19th century uh, the Habsburg uh, uh, how it was working also inside the palace and uh, the, the family. But of course the question is like who was Sisi? Because maybe you might don't know her. Here is very, she's very famous. And here we are. Sissi was uh, the nickname, or like the <laughs> short uh, way to call uh, the Empress uh, Elizabeth of Austria. She uh, was born in Bavaria, in Germany, in 1837. And uh, at a very young age, at the age about 15, she met uh, the, uh, the Emperor Franz Joseph I. He, fell in love uh, with her, so they married and she moved then to Vienna. She was a very special empress because um, she was uh, not really fitting in the very strict rules of the, of the Hofburg, of the Imperial Palace. She was, first of all, uh, very beautiful and uh, she was uh, kind of like uh, obsessed also with her beauty and with her uh, body. So here you can see uh, her very long hair. She spent every day, every evening, actually, hours like uh, doing uh, hair masks, using with the uh, egg yolks and as well cognac. Uh, she was um, also doing a lot of fitness. She was kind of like the Jane Fonda of the 19th century, we can say. They, there are people that are like, some people say that she was eating only an, an orange a day just to keep her shape. So she was not um, very obsessed with that. So she had also a lot of depression. She traveled, she didn't like to stay too much in Vienna. So she was traveling around Europe uh, uh, very much. Uh, and she loved, for example, Greece. She, uh, she owned also a palace there in, on an island. And, uh, um, and here you have another very famous picture of her. But her life kind of like uh, uh, changed very much uh, uh, in the year 1889 when uh, uh, her son Rudolf, that was the crown prince, committed suicide. And from that moment, this, uh, this event changed definitely her uh, her life. She kind of like was uh, even less uh, um, present in the public life. Uh, they say that she was wearing only only uh, these black widow dresses from that point on. And her life uh, went on and ended up actually also in a very tragic way because um, in uh, 1898, while she was on a holiday in Switzerland, in uh, Genève, uh, she was killed by an Italian anarchist. She was, she was murdered there. And, uh, and this is like, a, it's not a proper real image, but uh, just to give you an idea, also the, her, her, his husband, he was uh, definitely very destroyed by this, uh, by this, also because he lost as well uh, his son, the crown prince. But from that point on, after her death, uh, the, the myth of Sissi was created basically. And now she, I, 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 I call her always the pop star. Because uh, first of all, in the 50s, 60s, there were, were made quite a few movies about her with the Romy Schneider. We saw her uh, at the beginning. Um, then uh, there is a couple of years ago, so an animation movie, quite funny, German one was made. There is a musical uh, running also since a couple of years. If you come to Vienna, you will find a lot of different CC souvenirs, everything you can imagine with CC. And uh, even I did something a couple of years ago. I drew this uh, postcard with a more contemporary version of, uh, of Sissi and her kind of love to the, to the emperor. So as you see, Sissi the pop star. But uh, back to the, to the palace. Um, what do we have more that you can discover when you come here? Here you have uh, uh, all a very beautiful library. Uh, now it's called National Library. It was the, actually the Imperial Court uh, Library. Uh, the library itself is uh, very old. This building was uh, built in the 18th century. It's a beautiful Baroque 
uh, space. So it's worth visiting. And together with this part of the of the palace, which is called the New Hofburg, and the new because also because it's the newest part that was finished, as you see in 1913. So right before the beginning of the First World War. So inside this uh, this part of the palace, you will find also more museums. You have the Papyrus Museum, which is which has uh, one, if not the biggest collection of, uh, of this kind, uh, the Globe Museum, which is the, the only museum in the world which uh, with this Globe connect, uh, collection. You have the World Museum, which is a, um, a very, very nice ethnological museum. So you have plenty of things to see and to, and to do. And uh, the palace is not only, they're not only buildings, as you can see, but you have also space, open air space. The most uh, famous one or the most important one is definitely the Heldensplatz, which is translated like the hero square. And uh, in this, on this square, it's many, uh, many uh, big events happened over the, uh, the past century, but definitely one, one event that uh, stayed in the, uh, collective memories, let's say, was in the on March 15, 1938, because uh, uh, Austria was uh, became part of the Hitler's Nazi Germany, and Hitler came to Vienna and from exactly from that balcony, from the New Hofburg, uh, was uh, as he um, held his uh, speech in front of about 200,000 people. So it's kind of like a very dark uh, the beginning of a very dark period for uh, Austria as well. Um, but uh, this picture displays kind of like state connected to this imagery. And uh, the, other, the other green area that you have here around with a bit less uh, heavy history maybe uh, is definitely the Volksgarten, uh, the people's garden. Uh, here you have in the upper part a, a beautiful picture because there is this rose garden, especially if you come in spring or summer. It's for free, you just can walk in inside. It's it's really like there are so many roses. It's just beautiful, and there is even a, a perfect copy of a Greek temple, a little one, and uh, inside there are some uh, installation, art installation, uh, and you can also. It's quite interesting to have something like this. And here on the other side, you have the so-called Burggarten, which was the Kaiser Garden or the Emperor Garden. So it was a private uh, park, a private garden for the emperor. And it was, uh, uh, it was built uh, um, at, the, at the beginning of the 19th century and it was then made open to the public uh, about 100 years ago. And uh, this is, uh, uh, you have also a cafe inside and there is also this, uh, the Mozart uh, monument, which is the other pop star, Austrian pop star. So as you can see, we do have some pop stars still uh, uh, that are kind of like very, very famous and very important here. Um, in front of the palace, you have another square, which is the so-called the Maria Theresa Square. And it's called like this because of uh, this woman. And here there is her monument. Uh, this monument was finished uh, uh, in 1888. And this is the monument to Maria Teresa. And uh, the question is again, who was Maria Teresa or Empress Maria Teresa? This is a, a painting, a portrait of her. And uh, she uh, lived in the 18th century. And she was the, she's been, she was the only female ruler of the old Habsburg uh, dynasty. So uh, she was the only female who ruled uh, not alone, but together with her husband, the emperor. But uh, um, she was very, uh, she was very important because she made a lot of reforms, uh, especially, for example, about uh, public education, uh, reform in the economy, in the military. And she, so she was very busy to keep her her uh, empire under control and to improve and develop her empire. And she even had time to, uh, to have uh, 16 children, so many. <laughs> 11 girls and five boys. The girls were all called Maria, something like Maria Antonia, for example, uh, or Maria Luisa. And here Maria Antonia or Marie Antoinette, uh, is the most, uh, definitely the most famous one because she became then a uh, French uh, queen and she was the one that was then uh, um, 
uh, killed or beheaded during the French Revolution. She became also very famous with movies and uh, in the, for uh, it's still a very iconic, uh, iconic uh, person. And uh, so you can see the connection in Europe uh, through weddings and through uh, this kind of, uh, of uh, plans were very, very much common back then. So back to the to the square in front. What is why is this square so 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 important or so uh, so famous? Because here there are two uh, amazing museums. First of all, the Museum of Art History, which is on the same level as the Louvre or other ones uh, or the Vatican museums. It's an amazing collection of art. Uh, history uh, collected by the Habsburg family and they were put then inside this uh, gorgeous uh, building you can spend days inside and on the other side of the square there is the twin building which is the natural history museum and looks exactly the same and inside as you can imagine there is also the uh, natural history collection also uh, from the most for, of the Habsburg so you can see over the centuries they collected a lot of uh, very uh, valuable, important pieces, and thanks God we still have them. But uh, since we, there are not enough museums so far, here is another part, uh, the last part of the Imperial Palace, which is the so-called Museums Quarter. And uh, this was, uh, these were actually the Imperial Imperial stables back then. As you can see, uh, you can, if you go inside, you can still find these beautiful uh, horses uh, around uh, and uh, only sculptures uh, by now. And it became uh, a very, very beloved place to hang out in the evening, especially in summer. There are a lot of uh, bars, cafes, restaurants, uh, very nice museums as well. And one of my favorite is this one that you can see here in the back, this uh, whitish cube, which is the so-called the Leopold Museum. And inside you have the biggest collection of works by Egon Schiele, which was, uh, who was an Austrian expressionist artist, a uh, worldwide one of the most important ones and in my opinion one uh, very very interesting one so just like little suggestions if you come here so if uh, uh, as if you remember the the, the city center this is uh, the ring road so the if you see the mouse here is the imperial palace here there are the two museums and as i mentioned before at the beginning we had uh, uh, around, along this, uh, this road, which was uh, created uh, in the second half of the, uh, of the 19th century, they built also most of the, or many of the most important and representative uh, buildings. For example, we start with the parliament. And uh, just before I show you the others, I want to just uh, see also the, uh, the architectural style, because most of these buildings were built in a so-called historicism style, which means each building had a older style, architectural style, which was used with a very specific symbolic. For example, the parliament looks like a Greek temple. And uh, this is basically because uh, in ancient Greece, the democracy, democracy was born. Uh, we have the town hall, which looks like a Gothic, uh, it looks like a church, but it's not. It's a Gothic uh, uh, building, a new, a new Gothic actually. And, uh, and why this? Because in, during Middle Age, uh, the, so the, during the Gothic period, the towns and the cities gained in, uh, in, uh, in importance so in Europe. So it's a symbol of, of, uh, of towns. We have also other churches such as the Votive Church, also a, a neo-Gothic or new Gothic uh, uh, church. We have the university. Uh, this building, it's quite new, let's say. Uh, it's uh, the end is 1884, but the university itself was founded in the year 1365. And now it's still the oldest uh, uh, university in the modern German speaking countries. So it's uh, still a very, very, it's not the oldest one in Europe, but in the, in the, in the modern uh, contemporary German speaking country is the oldest one. We have also uh, the court theater, the Burgtheater, also beautiful, very important theater. We do have in the park uh, the most, uh, the, 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 the sculpture, which is the most uh, photographed one in all Austria, which is the sculpture of Johann Strauss. 
uh, the composer. And uh, not far away from the ring, we see from the ring road, we have also the Karlskirche, which is uh, the St. Charles Church. This was built, this is the older one. Uh, this is the Baroque Church. It's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful Baroque Church in Vienna. And it's very unique, especially with these two columns in the front and uh, which are not quite copies, we can say, from the uh, columns you can also see if you go to Rome, to the Roman Forum. So it's like a very, very spe special church and uh, really unique. And last but not least, we also have the Vienna State Opera. The uh, opera is, uh, Vienna is uh, famous for music, especially classic, uh, classical music. And uh, the state opera, this one was uh, opened in the year 1869. Uh, Franz Josef I and Sisi were uh, there when at the opening, uh, just to give you an idea of the timing. So we are again uh, at the time of Sisi. And uh, this is also how it looks in the front. Uh, at the beginning, it was not a huge success. The Viennese people likes a lot to complain, let's say. <laughs> They're famous also for that, but they didn't like this building that much. Um, and uh, they didn't like it so much that the two, uh, that the one architect that, uh, that planned it even committed suicide before the opening uh, because of the critics. And uh, his partner, uh, was uh, he died by natural death also a couple of weeks later so no none of them saw their uh, their project uh, being uh, um, inaugurated so you can imagine it's quite a, a dramatic uh, history but what you can see here is actually what was rebuilt and after the uh, after the second world war because uh, as you can see from this picture it was destroyed and, uh, uh, and it was uh, rebuilt, it took about 10 years and it was reopened in, in the year 1955. And it was a very symbolic reopening because it was the first public building that was rebuilt after the, the end of the war. And, uh, um, and it was kind of like a sign that Austria was ready you know, to start a new era, a new democratic and a new uh, positive era in its, in its uh, recent history. And uh, of course, you can see inside concert of uh, there is a lot of operas and so, but the opera house is also famous for uh, one bowl. Uh, Vienna loves to dance also. There are a lot of different bowls around Vienna, especially in January, February, but the opera bowl is the most famous one. So as you see, it's, uh, it's something you should see once. Uh, you can also, uh, if you're under, uh, 24, so the age of 24. Uh, so if you are quite young, you can also uh, apply for the debutant balls. It's quite expensive and you have to learn a lot of uh, dance moves, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's something that happens also during this uh, opera ball. So it's a very, very special event. And behind the opera, there is a place which is uh, the great, the best place to explain also another side of Vienna, which is the sweetest side. Uh, the place I'm talking about is this uh, is a hotel, which is right behind the opera house, and it's called Hotel Sacher. And you might know this cake, the Sacher cake. This is a chocolate cake uh, with this marmalade layer in between. It's covered with this chocolate uh, um, glaze. So you always, or you should always eat it with whipped cream because it's rather quite dry as a cake. And this is like the most iconic, most, most famous cake, Austrian cake. Uh, uh, worldwide, I would say, but it's definitely not the only one. I kind of like connected the <laughs> selection of, uh, collected a selection of, uh, of other sweets or uh, desserts that you can try once you come here. You have uh, like from apple strudel, you have the Topfenstrudel, which is like this sweet cheese strudel. You have different cream cakes. Uh, uh, you have this kind of like uh, uh, crepes, which is like uh, uh, also filled with marmalade. Uh, you have these round, um, uh, round bowls uh, that you can see here, for example, which are co called knödel, and you can eat them. Uh, they are either, either filled with fruits or with sweet cheese, or you can, I mean, there are really a lot of different ones. And one of my favorite, also the last one is this one, which is this uh, basically fried donuts. Uh, it's called Krapfen and it's filled with uh, um, uh, marmalade as well. 
and where to eat and to try these uh, amazing cakes, if not uh, in one of Vienna's most beautiful coffee houses. Vienna is famous also for the coffee houses, uh, uh, for the coffee tradition generally. Uh, here again, a selection of different coffees and uh, you can find, I am Italian and uh, you know, in Italy we are very, uh, we're very strict with coffee, but I have to say, I really enjoy also the Austrian, uh, some of the Austrian version, especially because you, if in Italy you usually drink the coffee and you go, in Vienna you drink the coffee and you sit down, you read your, uh, for example, newspaper, your books, you can stay hours inside these coffee houses. And some, some of them are really beautiful. This is just a selection of, of there are way more. There is, for example, the Café Central. They do also sometimes live music, uh, so piano, and uh, uh, you can see how elegant these places are. Café Gerstner, for example, or you have the Café Landmann. It's also for where Freud used to go. He was living right behind or like on the corner, over the corner there. Uh, you have others which are a bit more modern. Uh, I mean, they're, they're still old, but like a bit of a modernist touch, which is, for example, the Café Museum, or uh, last but not least, the Café Schwarzenberg, which was the first, so the oldest in this case, coffee house built on the Ring Road, the one, the, 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 the road we talked about uh, before. So definitely a place, uh, something that you have to do. And especially in winter when it's cold outside, it's really like really, really nice. And uh, I think we are now ready to leave the city center. And uh, of course, the best way to do it and to move around Vienna is the public system, a transportation system. Here you have uh, the map of the subways and uh, of some uh, local trains, city trains. Um, as you can see, it's quite, it's not too complicated, although it might look, there are, uh, the center is always the St. Stephen Cathedral, it's always strong like that, so it's hard to miss, and then uh, you have uh, basically by now five lines, there are divided by colors or number, like the red one, the number one, then you have the two, and so on, and these lines, they go basically through uh, the old city and the suburbs, suburbs, um, and here is the line six. If you watch, there are like one, two, three, four, six. So the, the number five is missing. And finally, after many, many years, they are building it. So we will get also the number num, line number five, which is at the end, the sixth line, at the new one. And here's some hard facts. Uh, of course, this year with the Corona uh, situation, way less people use the, the, the public transportation system, but um, this is uh, from 2019, so a lot of people, very, a lot of people use it every day. Uh, and to give you just an idea how many miles they covered, in 2019 they covered more than five times the distance you need to, to go around the Earth. So it's just an amazing, um, an amazing distance. And, uh, and I can say I'm living here since 17 years. I do not own a car and I'm actually not missing it. So it's really easy to move around. It's very fast, day and night, very safe. So it's really like, uh, it's just great. And as I said, we are ready to leave the city center. So we are here now, Karlsplatz, which is uh, where the opera house is. Um, and uh, we are going to Schönbrunn, to the summer palace of the Habsburg. Now there are like six stops, which was, uh, which takes 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Back then it took uh, kind of like one, two, three days to move everything to go to the summer residence. And this is how it looks like once you arrive there. Uh, it's a beautiful, amazing, huge, actually complex palace. Uh, a bit in the style of, uh, let's say, also in Paris, the Versailles, but not the same, a bit smaller. And, uh, but before we see how it looks like around also the park and everything, I just want to give you a very short, very brief history. And uh, this is like uh, uh, in the, since the 14th century, uh, the, um, since the 14th century in this place, there was, uh, there has been like a little um, estate with uh, a little building and some, uh, uh, yes, um, some uh, uh, grounds or some space and it, like, uh, and it uh, didn't belong to the Habsburg since the beginning. The first emperor, the first Habsburg emperor who bought this estate was the 
Emperor Maximilian II. So we're talking of the 16th century. And he used it as a hunting ground, uh, as uh, it was quite common back then. And uh, he started building, there was also a water mill, there was these little uh, like stables and so on. And uh, the name was also different, it was not Schumbrunn. And uh, the name uh, Schumbrunn came, this is the legend says, with uh, another emperor, uh, so the successor of uh, Maximilian II, Emperor Matthias, who during uh, a hunting uh, uh, event, he, the legend says he found um, a, a water spring in the park. And he just said like, uh, such a beautiful water spring. And this is translated in German, uh, schöne Brunne. So schön Brunne means exactly this, basically the, um, such a beautiful water spring. But uh, the name didn't change immediately. It was then uh, a Italian, Empress. She was the uh, actually the, the wife of a Habsburg and Eleonora Gonzaga. And uh, she was the one that uh, uh, at the beginning of the 17th or the first half of the 17th century, she loved very much uh, this, uh, this place. She was not that much into politics. She preferred to have a, a place where she could uh, host also hunting parties, so have guests coming, music uh, playing also, especially Italian music. So we're talking, she imported a lot of art and music also from Italy. And she started, she changed the name and she started building it uh, and uh, expanding it. And, uh, but uh, this didn't uh, last that long because uh, we are back again to the, uh, to the Ottoman Empire. We, I mentioned that uh, they tried twice to conquer Vienna. This is, uh, a, a depicting, uh, this is depicting the, uh, the second attempt in 1683. They didn't manage, as I said, here you can see Vienna, it's not completely realistic if you see the geography, but this gives you an idea. And Schönbrunn is kind of like somewhere behind here. So it's not really like close to the city. And of course they, they occupied and destroyed and took everything from the palace back then. So they had to rebuild everything. And uh, the proper project for this palace started then in the, uh, at the end of the 17th century with the Emperor Leopold I and this architect, which is a very important uh, architect here in Vienna, Fischer von Erlach, his name. And as you can see, these projects were kind of like, they tried also, they wanted to do something like Versailles. They kind of like Versailles was the example to follow, but at the end they decided to, uh, also it was a matter also of, uh, again, of money, uh, but uh, uh, it didn't uh, became anything like this because uh, the one that then took, uh, to take, took care of the palace, uh, how it, and the, of the transformation, especially in this old, with these Baroque uh, uh, changes was then again, Maria Teresa at the, uh, in, uh, in the 18th century. She loved Schumbrunn uh, and she, here you have two paintings uh, that you can also see in the uh, Art History Museum we talked about before. And uh, Schumbrunn became more and more uh, the center also of the uh, social life in the, uh, of the, of the noble uh, person, I mean, of the noble uh, families here in Vienna. We ha I have also to say that uh, during Maria Teresa time, the park that you will, I will show you in a while, uh, the park became also public. So normal Viennese people were able to enjoy and to, to go there and enjoy this beautiful park. But what did she do? She, for example, she built a theater inside the palace, she changed and she did all this uh, gorgeous uh, uh, decoration and restyling of the, of the spaces. As you can see also with these uh, uh, wall paintings and a lot of gold, very typical in this Baroque time. And uh, uh, another person uh, or another VIP, let's say, who, who stayed uh, twice actually in Schumbrunn was also Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, as you, if you remember, I told you that uh, Napoleon uh, put an end to the Holy Roman Empire, this powerful empire in Europe. And uh, when he did it, he actually arrived in Vienna and stayed twice in Vienna. And of course, he stayed in uh, Schönbrunn. 
And here there is a, a, a also a picture of like uh, his troops coming. He used also to stay to greet the troops quite uh, if not on a daily, uh, not every day, but quite often. So it was also kind of like a very special event for uh, the common people. As I said, it was open to the public, the park, so they could also see this uh, very famous, very uh, hated and loved, beloved and say uh, Napoleon. And these are the apartments where he was living. And exactly during such a greeting of the troops, he also risked his life because uh, there was also a murder attempt as well, which didn't work. But so you can, uh, Schumbrun was uh, also like uh, uh, quite, uh, quite a lot of things were happening for uh, Napoleon as well. And uh, the last emperor actually that loved Schumbrun so much, he was even born there. Uh, was Franz Josef I, so uh, the, the, the husband of Sisi. He was born in Schumbrunn. Uh, he spent most of his life in Schumbrunn, so he didn't stay too much also in the Hofburg, the palace we saw before. And uh, you can see here there are some pictures of, uh, of his apartments and as well uh, some events that were happening in the park uh, with him. He is also the responsible of this color, the so-called Schönbrunn yellow, uh, which you can find basically in many, quite often in other uh, important uh, representative buildings in countries or cities which were under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it became quite common to paint it yellow if it was also a very important uh, building. And of course, not only, not only Franz Josef was there, but also his wife, Sissi. This is, for example, he was one of her room, her beauty makeup place, or like private uh, bathroom. And uh, yes, and how does it look now, Schumbrun, after so much history? This is uh, a view from above. It's not even fitting everything inside. It's really like huge, the park. Here is the, is, the, is the palace we were talking about. This is the entrance. And uh, here in the back is also this hill. I will show you that more uh, in, a, uh, in a moment. And uh, there are different, different buildings also. We have also this called Orangerie, which uh, was used to, to, to put in winter, for example, in winter time, the uh, citrus trees in order to uh, not to to to, yeah, to let them survive over winter. Um, they had also private gardens that were uh, accessible only for to the family. One is the Crown Prince Garden here, and the other one was the Chamber Garden right here. And uh, during Maria Theresa, the park uh, became uh, this uh, very structured, very um, rich baroque garden with a lot of. Um, of buildings and, mo and uh, monuments. The first one, the most, the one that you see immediately coming is the so-called Gloriette, uh, which is now this very elegant uh, cafe or coffee house. And it sits on the top of this hill. And on the bottom, you have the, um, the so-called Neptune fountain. And here you can see this beautiful view from the, from the park up with the fountain and the Gloriette. You have other fountains as well, or like you have, for example, this obelisk fountain, you have even uh, kind of like fake Roman ruins. Um, you have uh, a Palmen house here in the very end, uh, which is also a very beautiful um, uh, building. And uh, they liked also to have fun. There is also, of course, a maze, which is, was then rebuilt uh, 20 years ago. And last but not least, we have the zoo. The zoo, it's, uh, uh, it says it's the oldest zoo in the world. It's a very historical place. I, I don't like zoo generally, but I have to say that this one is uh, it's quite, it's quite nice. Um, and uh, this is uh, Yang Yang. Uh, Yang Yang is this uh, panda, female panda. She is a bit uh, the mascot of, uh, of the zoo. She is with, she, they put her a bit everywhere in the advertisement, of course, with Photoshop and so on. She's not now in front of the palace, but this is a picture, a real picture of uh, her with her last uh, two twins. So she's really like uh, quite, uh, quite lovely. And, uh, but it's really like worth of, of visiting. So you can also spend like one day here because it's an open park. It's a park for everyone. So you can also, uh, you can also do jogging and so on. Uh, but uh, they do once a year, a very special, again, a very special event, which is free for everyone. And it's the so-called summer night concert. 
it is usually in September, at the end of September, if I'm not wrong. And, uh, um, and I found a very, again, a very short uh, video, which you might find uh, interesting. So here we go. So <laughs> it's very, I, I, I thought it was perfect for this, uh, for this uh, presentation tonight. And you can see, you could see the setting is amazing. Uh, and this event is, as I said, the concert with the Philharmonic of Vienna, one of the best Philharmonic worldwide for free. It's also not, doesn't happen every day. So it's really like if you're here, just use this chance. And uh, since it's also time, we're close to Christmas. Christmas is also famous for, uh, Vienna is also famous for the Christmas uh, period. This year, of course, is something different. Uh, there is no proper Christmas in the city, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, Schönbrunn, during, uh, the, from the middle of uh, November until Christmas, it looks kind of like this. So it's, uh, there is this Christmas market. Uh, it's a fairy tale-like uh, setting, as you can see. Uh, here there are just like some, uh, some products you can find from um, the gingerbread. You have the glühwein, which is this hot red wine with spices uh, you have also again kind of donuts so there are way more way more things but uh, uh, but of course Schönbrunn is not the only place where you can celebrate Christmas here in Vienna uh, this is again Maria Theresa Square the one with the Maria Theresa statue and the two museums uh, you have uh, Christmas in front Christmas market in front of the town hall for example and this is one usually the biggest one and the most touristic one uh, there is also ice skating there through the parks so it's really like uh, there is plenty to do you have also in front of the saint uh, charles church uh, as you can recognize again the uh, the two columns uh, which is a really nice one i like it quite a lot or you have it for example next to the saint stephen square uh, cathedral uh, this one is quite small i have to say but Compare, but you still have, uh, you have a small market, but you have these uh, amazing Christmas lights, which it looks really like a, uh, like a elegant uh, palace or dancing room for, from an old palace. So and it's, it's really like very much Viennese uh, Christmas uh, decoration in the, in the streets. And uh, then you have the most contemporary version of the Christmas market, which is inside the museum's quarter. Uh, the one uh, where the imperial stables were, uh, where you can also, you, here you basically only drink and eat something and there is there DJs, music, so uh, it's more the younger version of the Christmas market. And last but not least, there are way more, but like uh, this is also one that uh, I like quite a lot and it's uh, at the Belvedere. Uh, Belvedere is, uh, Brun is a palace, it's the biggest palace it, uh, uh, in the inner complex with the park. It's not the only one. Um, here you have uh, uh, the uh, Belvedere, which looks like this. Uh, the difference with the Schönbrunn is that uh, this is not, uh, this was not belonging to, uh, to the Habsburg, it was belonging to a Feld Marshal, uh, and uh, it was built in the, uh, in the 18th century. And, uh, uh, and it is more central. You will see it uh, in a while, in a moment. And it's built, it's, compo it's composed by two buildings, the lower Belvedere and uh, the upper Belvedere. And I, I wanted to mention, to show you this one also because in the upper Belvedere, there is a, a, a museum. And here you can uh, find the famous, uh, the kiss, the painting by Gustav Klimt which is one of the, um, of the most famous paintings uh, worldwide again. And uh, of course, you can just like uh, also have a walk without going to the museum. The garden is open to everyone. Uh, you have also a very nice view over this town. You can see here, for example, the St. Stephen Cathedral, the South Tower. And uh, right next to it, there is also uh, the so-called Botanical Garden. Oops. Yes, which is like here. And this looks like this. And uh, it was created by uh, under Maria Theresa time. So you can see she was very busy. She, Maria Theresa, the Empress was very, very busy. She did a lot of things in Vienna. And, uh, but generally the green, uh, green areas are uh, quite common here. About, they say about 50% of the, of the surface of Vienna is basically uh, either a park garden or any kind of green. And uh, the biggest one is the so-called Prater. 
And to give you an idea where we are now, so this is the St. Stephen's Cathedral. And here there is the ring road. And here was the Belvedere, the one that we just uh, visited, virtually visited. Here's the Danube. And this is the so-called Prater. Uh, as you can see, it's quite a big park. Uh, here's another view from above. Uh, it's, uh, and it's the biggest park in, uh, in the city. It's not completely central, so we cannot totally compare it maybe to Central Park in New York, but it's still, uh, it, uh, since it's very well connected, it's, uh, it's kind of like, it feels a bit like this. Uh, it was a hunting ground, uh, so a private hunting ground, but in the 18th century, or at the end of the, in the second half of the 18th century was made public. They kept on hunting until uh, the 1920s, so quite late, I would say, now not anymore. And once you arrive uh, to, the, to the Prater, the first thing you see you and you encounter is the uh, amusement park. Uh, it works like this, you don't pay an entrance, you pay uh, the single rides. And here you have another landmark of Vienna. And this is especially this picture here, it's nice because you see the St. Stephen's Cathedral and the giant Ferris wheel. This uh, Ferris wheel um, is uh, quite an old one, as you can see, 1897. It, it was for many uh, years the tallest one, of course, not anymore. Um, it, uh, uh, it, during, uh, it was damaged during World War II. There were way more wagons. Now there are only 15 left. But it's a great place if you like to take pictures, especially in sunset or in the night or anyway, to, to, to see Vienna from above is really nice. And also if... Um, Oops, sorry, wrong, yes. And also if you are into movies or a bit more older movies, uh, I really suggest you The Third Man. Uh, and this movie is it's an English movie with Orson Welles uh, from 1949. And it's, um, it's a spy movie, so it's quite, uh, quite, quite nice. It was, uh, they say it was like the best English movie ever made uh, or the second best. And here it's like a, a one picture of it where you can see the, the giant fairy wheels because in this movie you can, uh, they show Vienna right after the end of the Second World War. So you still see the destruction, you still see everything. It's quite, it's, it's a very interesting movie also because of that, not only because of the story. And uh, after the, the uh, or next to the amusement park, you start, the, the proper park starts. There is a very long, uh, um, very long avenue or main uh, avenue, which is about 2.7 miles long, or like let's say four and a half kilometer. And uh, this looks like this. So it's uh, basically pedestrian. You can run, you can bicycle, use the bicycle. So you can even take a little train uh, and go and explore a little bit the, the woods, the floor, the forest. You can, as you can imagine, also just relax and lay down or play if you have children. Or if you go to the very end of this uh, of the park, you will find the wilder part, which is um, which was uh, and it, it is left as it was at the beginning because, as you can see from the picture, here is already the Danube here up in the upper left part of the of this photo. So uh, this is how basically kind of like look like the original Danube or the, the side of it. And this is how it was. Uh, it was uh, uh, until not so long ago. So it was quite a wild uh, river. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the Danube is the second longest river in Europe. It's very wild, was very big. So this, all this area was not really used by the city of Vienna uh, because of the floods, for example. So what happened at the, uh, at the end of the, uh, or in the 20th century, in uh, the 80s, they decided and they, think they started to regulate properly this, uh, this river and now looks kind of like this. So it's a very straight river. Uh, here you see again the Danube Canal, the one that goes to the very center, to the old town. And, uh, uh, and what happened during this uh, regulation with, uh, because of the flood, so to protect the city, they create this, uh, uh, this island, that so-called the Danube Island. And this island, it's uh, about 13 miles long, so 21 kilometers, so it's very long. It's everything is uh, made by men. Uh, it was finished in, in 1987 and it became immediately, and it's still now the favorite place 
for the Viennese people or for the people living in Vienna uh, in summer and spring. Uh, you can swim there uh, in the river. You can, there are bars, there are restaurants. Uh, you, can, uh, you can imagine 30 miles is quite long. So you can do a lot of jogging. You can go skating. You can do, it's like, it's like the summer, the, the summer place for the for Vienna and it's very easy to reach there is a, you are with the metro with the subway or with other uh, or with a bicycle it's very very easy to reach and it's just uh, uh, an amazing place to spend uh, a nice summer day thank you very much it was <laughs> I hope you really enjoyed it and I hope you understood why I fell in love with this city 17 years ago and while I'm still living here so thank you Oh, that was so amazing. And you picked the exact right thing to end this tour with. So thank you very much. You're more um, than welcome, Mara. I'm sure I am speaking for everyone, Raffaele, when I say thank you for putting all of your time and attention. But you know what I, I see is your passion. You know, I really see that you have a passion for this city and I can understand why you have adopted it as your own. Um, to the rest of you, the audience, we are getting ready for our Q&A, and um, I would love for you to put your questions into the, to the Q&A tool on the Zoom toolbar, and um, while you're doing that, I'll just mention that this tour is free to attend, and obviously, um, we put them out there for everyone to enjoy, but Rafaela does a lot of work to prepare for this tour, and if you would like to tip him, there are ways to tip the tour director. Um, I have put up a couple ways on the slide. I accept Venmo, PayPal, um, a credit card through my website, girltraveltours.com. And also if you want to send a personal check, you can email me at marawalsh at gmail.com and I will make sure to give you an address for that. Again, my name is Mara with an H. So just make sure that when you're sending um, sending your PayPal and, and you're emailing me, you're using my full name, which is Mara with an H, marawalsh at gmail.com. Okay, so Raffaele, I'm sure I didn't give you a whole lot of time to look at the questions, but we are gonna go to the Q&A at this point. And I'd like you to just start from the top and, and start to address them. Um, yeah, sure. And I will help you try to get through them. I'm going to put myself on mute and hopefully you can start by reading the question and giving answers as you know them. Yes, I have, uh, I mean, one of the first questions I see here is quite uh, recent and it's about uh, what happened a month ago. It's about how, how, I, how I, am, I am and the other Guineas after the recent terrorist attack. We are all fine. So uh, it's uh, these terrible events happen also here. It's just weird and, and terrifying to have them. Uh, here in uh, my my hometown, but uh, let's go back to some more happy <laughs> happy topics. Uh, uh, we are um, yes. What is the predom predominant religion? Uh, definitely is uh, Catholic. Uh, Catholic. Uh, Austria is a very uh, very Catholic uh, country. They do have other. Of course, uh, the all the religions are. Uh, uh, here also present and so but the catholic part is uh, uh, the catholic church is definitely the most um, the most important uh, uh, important one um, the um, so the other question that i have is if the Habsburgs are not uh, related or are related to the uh, lines of the queen elizabeth yes uh, if you it's it's very complicated but uh, let's say like this in europe everyone was re was related to, <laughs> to everyone <laughs> as i mentioned there was a lot of uh, of uh, of uh, planned weddings between the royal families uh, and through that through these weddings they were also able to uh, to make friends uh, let's say or to to not to have problems with enemies with other uh, powers uh, and so you can it's just like they are definitely also related so everyone is kind of like related here in Europe uh, the, from the royal family uh, this is the question about the trap family from Sound of Music. So if, if the trap family is important in Austria. And uh, okay, I have to be honest, my, ex my personal experience, I moved here, as I said, uh, 17 years ago. And, uh, um, and uh, uh, I never heard <laughs> anything about the Sound of Music until let's say like three, four years ago when I started 
doing a, a tour director, so working as a tour director. And, uh, um, and this is interesting because in Italy it's not really the movie, for example, is not really the famous. In Austria, it became kind of famous, especially, of course, in Salzburg. But uh, uh, I, I, I had an experience, for example, that while I was, uh, I was trying to buy the DVD in Salzburg to play it on a bus, on a tour, uh, to, so to buy the DVD of the, of the Sound of Music, and I went to three, four big shops, actually, uh, and nobody knew what was Sound of Music. So uh, I found it, I managed to find it in a souvenir shop at the end. But it's, so you, just to give you an idea, it's not really like this big as uh, you can imagine, or as it is big uh, in other countries in the world. Um, so uh, this is also an interesting question. Is there any indication that the residents of the Habsburg Empire were satisfied with the way they ruled? Uh, it's again, not an easy question, but uh, let's say that the Habsburg Empire, especially the, 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 last, um, uh, the last century, so let's say in the 19th century, so with the Austrian and Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, it was a big melting pot. Um, so it was like a lot of different uh, cultures, also different religions. Uh, uh, I don't remember exactly the number, but like uh, different languages. So, and somehow they managed to not to impose their power on them, but like to give them kind of like their own, in a way, uh, freedom also. So even of religion, of like uh, of their own culture. So they kind of like uh, they were. Uh, of course, not everybody was happy, I'm sure about that, but, but uh, somehow it, it, it's kind of like they managed to, to, to give their, uh, they, um, to give them their, uh, their kind of like uh, personal freedom also. Um, uh, so, um, is the Schönbrunn Palace is the same as the Imperial Palace? So uh, the Imperial Palace was, let's say, let's call it the Winter Palace. So the Hofburg, the one that we saw uh, in the city, the big one, was the uh, so-called Winter Palace. And uh, during summer, they, uh, the family, the Habsburg, usually went uh, to uh, to the Schönbrunn, which was back then way outside the city. So it took that's why it took also quite long to go there. But uh, uh, that was their summer residence. So is there a ring road basically following the old city walls? Uh, basically, yes. Uh, basically, yes, because uh, uh, in the in the in the middle or like in, uh, yes, let's say in the middle of the 19th century, so 1857 actually, to be exact, uh, the Emperor Franz uh, Josef I decided to, uh, to, uh, to tear down the city walls. As you can imagine, the, uh, everything changed, so such city walls were not really effective anymore, and uh, also he needed like kind of like uh, space also uh, around his uh, in his town also to uh, it was a very revolutionary moment so to build such a big road back then uh, was also a, a way for for the for the emperor to be able to control the the folk to control the his people like the population in case of rebellion rebellion and so on so it was uh, they they built it on the on the on the top or say on the same spot more or less where the city walls were, but it was a very big project. So uh, it was like, uh, it was not only tearing down the, the city, the, the, the walls, let's say like. Uh, what language is spoken? Yes, um, I, it, uh, I, it's German. It's uh, basically German. Um, it is, uh, um, so the Och, High German or Och Deutsch, as they say here. Uh, so it's the same as in Germany and so on. Of course, the, the dialects are quite uh, common to hear, to be hear, heard here. Um, it's, uh, they, 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 they do love speaking the dialects. I also like to listen. You can really understand where, which, uh, who is coming from which part of Austria, but the, 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 the proper German is the official language. Uh, many, uh, can, uh, yes, this question about World War II, were many buildings destroyed in World War II? Uh, they say that uh, around 30% of the city was destroyed during uh, World War II, so with the bombings and especially the last part, so quite a lot. And also if you go, if you, if you, if you are here in, uh, in, uh, in Vienna, you come to Vienna and you walk, for example, in the old town, every time you see a modern building, usually you can uh, understand or you can think that this is where a bomb 
destroy the building because um, uh, they rebuilt, of course, uh, these empty spaces with more modern architecture. So it's uh, it's also like also interesting to see where the bombs were uh, um, falling down and. Um, Yes. Um, yeah. Also, again, uh, uh, re related to the to the city wall. Uh, if the city walls around the city still exist, no. They there is only one gate left uh, by the imperial palace, but it's not really like. Uh, uh, but it's not really. Um, so. Um, uh, what are, uh, how tall is the South Tower? I, I said it, but it was maybe very fast. It's uh, 446 feet, which is like 136 uh, meters. So the South Tower of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the cathedral. Can you walk up to the Pumerin? Um, you, can, as you cannot go where the Pumerin is. You can climb uh, actually both uh, towers. And uh, of course, both have a different height, height. So it's like different view, but it's really worth of, uh, of going there. So really, really, really. Um, uh, so, uh, ta -ta -ta. yeah, can you please this also? So about the roof, so we have like, yes, the roof is, uh, uh, is unusual of the cathedral. As I mentioned, it's made out of these color tiles. There are a lot, it's very unique for a church like this to have this colorful uh, roof. And this, uh, believe me, if you come there, it's one real things that you see and it's really impressive. Uh, the two-headed eagle is a symbol of both Austria and Imperial, Imperial Russia. The eagle, either with one or two heads, it, was, it has always been since the Roman time a symbol of power and of empires and of even also during the Nazi time, they're all different ways. So it's not only an Austrian or Russian uh, um, symbol that they only they and they use. So that you can find it quite often in the history. Um, So uh, yes, the the, the uh, so what will, <laughs> um, so I, the, about the coat of arms of the Habsburg uh, because the question is I thought initially you showed the coat of arms of the Habsburg to be a lion. Uh, yes, on the Stephen uh, the lion. This is the the house of Habsburg. It's uh, what he has this uh, re red lion. The, uh, the 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 double headed eagle and the eagle are then symbol of the uh, of the empire and uh, of the Austrian empire. So it's like uh, it's not the house of Habsburg. So there are always it's quite of difficult to it's always quite complicated to to separate the two of them. Um, do you recommend making a reservation in advance online for tours of the cathedral? Um, it is hard to say it now because uh, as you, right now nothing is happening because of COVID, because of Corona. So I don't know how it will be or when are you planning to come. Uh, it's always good to book it a bit in advance, but I, I, I think that uh, uh, the, the earlier, let's say, the sooner you book it, the better it is. This is always my, my philosophy, <laughs> but uh, I think you can quite find easily at least one tour. If not of the cathedral, you can find guides also for the, uh, if, if not of the catacombs, you can find a guided tour of the cathedral quite easy. Um, why were the bodies under the cathedral buried in different places? Uh, this is also an interesting question because there are like uh, uh, three places in Vienna, uh, the most famous one, uh, the St. Stephen Cathedral, then there is uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, Kapuzina Gruft, which is a crypt, uh, and another church, which is the so-called uh, August so Augustinian Church. It's also in the Imperial Palace. And uh, uh, usually back then, they kind of like divided, they had this separated, uh, they, they used to separate uh, the heart, which was the purest part of the body of the Habsburg, or of the dead person and put it somewhere in a very specific urn and put the body somewhere else. So it's kind of like it became a tradition that went on until the end of the 19th century. So it was, uh, uh, as a colleague of mine once said, uh, uh, if usually the people uh, you say rest in peace for the Habsburg, you say rest in pieces, because this is what basically happened quite often. Um, uh, so, uh, when did the Lipizzaner school first begin? So, the first uh, mention of it was at the end, I have also the, uh, the special, the date, uh, which was, um, I just have to find the exactly number. 
uh, eight uh, years, sorry. Um, it was, uh, in, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, uh, 1580 or something like that. So in the 1500, the end of the 1500s. And the, the breed, this breed of the Lipitzaner comes not from Vienna, but from a town which is called uh, Lipica or Lipica. I cannot speak uh, Slovenian, so I'm not sure, which is in, uh, in Slovenia. So it was back then under the, the empire, and the, the, under the territories of the Habsburg, but uh, uh, yes, but it comes uh, from there. And it's, that's why it's quite, uh, quite old also. Uh, the, also related to the, to the Spanish is like, can this be seen year round, the Spanish riding school? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, right now it's again, it's closed. So usually let's talk always with about general uh, uh, general uh, answer yes you can uh, you can there are shows uh, in the evening i think once a week or twice a week and uh, in the morning you can also see the training uh, which costs a bit less and uh, it's a bit shorter also but it's still they do uh, you can see how they train the young horses so it's quite quite nice really nice um <laughs> Can we hear this? So yes, so now I now I, I have uh, I'm not in the presentation anymore. Uh, but if you if you the question is like uh, because of the, the sound at the beginning didn't work. So uh, if we can hear now the same Stephen Bell, um, the the best is like to to in Google to write uh, Pumerin and you will find uh, you will find it because now I'm not in the in this uh, in the presentation anymore. But yeah, sorry for that. Really sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> So then I have, um, wait, I have to read also. So the question is, was Maria Teresa Habsburg descendant or did she marry into the Habsburg family? Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's interesting because she was a descendant. Uh, the problem was that, uh, that uh, she was the only, uh, the only descendant. So she was a female. So she had to, she married another, uh, another royal, let's say, family, uh, which was called the Lothringer. So the uh, Lothring Lothringen and, uh, and she, uh, but she, although her husband uh, Francis was uh, not was the emperor, uh, she was basically the one that ruled. So she had the one, the thing, uh, yeah, the the power to say that. So that's why she was the only female uh, female uh, ruler officially uh, or unofficially. Um, was Adolf Hitler Austria? Yes, he was. Uh, uh, there are many. It's always like a bit of a taboo topic, you know, especially, of course, here in Austria. He was born in uh, Braunau, which is a small town not too far from Vienna. It's close to Linz, if you remember the, the, the country, uh, the, the, the regions. And, uh, but he, he also tried to, he lived also in Vienna. Uh, he tried also to apply or he applied twice at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. Both times he was uh, rejected and then he moved to, to Germany and everything happened what we know. So um, it's always like this question, what if they accepted him as a painter, but it didn't happen. So um, uh, does the river ever flood? Uh, the building seemed seem to be on the same level. Uh, the river, the Danube, uh, it's, uh, uh, it is now and now with this new uh, regulation of the river, which is like, uh, remember this very straight um, uh, river, uh, it's basically not really flooding anymore. And that's the big thing because they, uh, with this island in the middle, they managed to keep one side of the, of the river lower than the other side. And so in case of a flood, they can open the one side which is lower and let the, the water flow uh, in so they can keep it under control. So uh, of course, except it's like a huge millennial flood, I don't know. But, uh, and also next to the river now, there are not that many, let's say, buildings, it's not in the center of the, of the city. Um, so, uh, uh, what percent, what percentage of Austria speaks different language? As I don't know now the percentage, I can say that there are like parts of, uh, of Austria, uh, especially the one in the Eastern part. So where they do speak, for example, they have also like, uh, they, they, they speak both languages, which is for example, with Hungarian or German or like in the South with Slovenian and German. So because of like this border region and they have a very interesting, very long history also to explain why. So 
it's uh, uh, it's uh, yes, it's there are p parts uh, where they do speak also other languages. Um, the Saint, Saint Charles uh, Church, uh, it looks like there are small rooms on the top of the two towers. Uh, can they be accessed and what are you, as they cannot be accessed by normal people, you can, you used to go uh, also to be able to go to the top uh, of the of the dome. Uh, there was also an elevator, there is, uh, but it's like now, right now it's also closed. It's, uh, but it's worth also without going up to the roof, it's really worth of what is going inside because it's, uh, it's just an amazing Baroque uh, church. Uh, is the era okay? Wait, no, sorry. Um, how long is the ring road? Uh, the ring road is about uh, four kilometers, which is, I think, like something like seven, eight miles. If I'm not, no, wait, I'm uh, just, I, I just, I always very bad with the. Um, uh, I have somewhere written like uh, an example, not 2.7 miles, sorry, 2.5 miles, something like that. So it's quite, quite long. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, the question was about also are those debutants about the, 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 the opera video, the state, the opera ball? Uh, yes, there were, uh, uh, they were uh, also uh, in the video, there were also part of the debutants, which are these younger couples, because uh, during the or at the beginning of the opera ball, there is also their, uh, their show. So it's like, and it's when they are introduced officially to the. Uh, to the Viennese uh, high society, let's say. Um, I'm curious about what motivated Raffaele to move to Vienna. This is a very long, uh, very interesting question, but very long answer. I will keep it short. Uh, I, it just happened that I moved here. I didn't plan to move here. I just came here uh, during my studies of architecture and I did then an exchange here in Vienna and I just liked it a lot. And uh, it's really a great place to live. Uh, it's safe, it's, uh, it's, there are plenty of things to do, a lot of culture a lot of green as you see um, it's it's really like it's also quite central in Europe so it's relatively easy to to go to other places either with by train or by plane so it's really like uh, I, I kind of like uh, like sometimes as you may as everyone has as a experience in their life they're like um, um, sometimes things happens without uh, uh, expecting that and that's why I'm still here <laughs> so it's nice um so let's see mm -hmm. how many days should we plan spend to spend in vienna in order to have a good overview of the city um this is i mean let's say uh by, with three days you cover the uh let's say the basics uh the vienna is not a huge metropole i mean it's like everything is quite close by you can move uh, around very easily so you can see a lot uh three days is is okay of course you can stay also here one week if you can and if you want to discover a bit more of the uh you know outside of the, the the typical things and you want to discover a little bit more of course the more time you have the better it is but uh, but yes i mean three days Yes, you can combine it also to, to explore a little bit of the surroundings in Vienna that are really beautiful, especially along the Danube uh, with this, uh, uh, there is also a lot of castle ruins and good wines, it's great. I mean, it, there are a lot of things to do also if you have more time. So, uh, are most of the museums and palaces open year round? Yes, they are. Again, we are not talking about 2020. <laughs> 2020, we forget 2020, usually they are. Um, where is Gustav Klimt art exhibition? And I saw another question about Klimt, who was Klimt? Um, yes, so the Klimt exhibition, let's say Gustav Klimt was uh, uh, a very important painter, artist, uh, Austrian artist. Uh, and lived, he lived at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the uh, 20th century, and he was uh, a big star here. He, uh, he, was, uh, um, he started also the, uh, or he was part of the, of a, of a new movement in Vienna, artist new movement. He was part of the so-called Jugendstil, or let's say Art Nouveau, also the French uh, version of it. Uh, so he was kind of like a big name and uh, his works are uh, a bit spread in some museums. So, so the most of them or the most, some of the most famous are in the Belvedere, the palace uh, we saw at 
the end. Uh, some others are also at the uh, Leopold Museum, which is inside the museum's quarter, uh, you know, with the one with the, with the square, with the people and the cafes, so on. So they are like, uh, and some of them are also traveling around the world to, to, to go to other museums for exhibitions. Um, so I heard that in recent years there has been issues in Austria, especially with refugees and so on, resulting in increasing crime. Is it true? Uh, I mean, Europe generally has to face facing uh, a big, uh, big problem. It's a very difficult situation uh, what these refugees, uh, refugee people, are uh, experiencing, as well as, of course, in the European country, how they deal with it. It's there is not. It's not an easy, easy answer, easy task. Um, Vienna is uh, anyway, it was kind of like experienced a bit of, uh, of, of stress, let's say a couple of years ago when it really started, but, but it's not, uh, Vienna is still a safe place. I mean, it's uh, in Europe there are, uh, it's, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, that it didn't become dangerous. It, it became more interesting because there are more people from around the world that live here. This is just my, my personal opinion also. Um, uh, who is the conductor of For Stars and Stripes? Oh, I have it on the video. Now I don't remember the name. <laughs> Very bad. But uh, I can, uh, I can, uh, I can see it again, and I will, <laughs> I will tell you. Um, so. So what church is Sisi and Franz Josef uh, sarcophagus is also tomb or coffin is uh, inside. Uh, it's in the so-called uh, um, um, <laughs> Kapuziner Gruft, uh, which is uh, uh, which is uh, the um, this, uh, this, uh, this little church with this uh, with this um, um, place under it, uh, this uh, crypt. And here there are the most of the sarcophags of the most of the or more most of the Habsburg to um, where they 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 they, they lay they, they are and you can visit it. It's really really interesting, especially if you are into the Habsburg uh, also family tree and you want to understand the connection. This is really like the place you can visit, and it's in the very center of the city. Um, so, uh, what is the average temperature at Christmas time? I can tell you, like live right now, we have uh, five uh, degrees Celsius, which are, I don't remember, I have to check <laughs> how many Fahrenheit are. I'm always very bad with that, but I just need a moment. So, five Celsius are about 41 degrees uh, Fahrenheit right now, but uh, it snowed a couple of uh, last week. It there was a little bit of snow, so it's it's not it's not that that cold anymore. Let's say like this, it's getting global warming everywhere. I guess. Uh, are they going to have any markets, uh, Christmas markets this year? No, uh, they started building it, but uh, they they decided the government decided now to not to let it happen because of of the situation. So no Christmas market. So this is like quite sad. Uh, where is the Jewish ghetto and the synagogues? Um, okay, the synagogue is uh, in the first district in the old town. Uh, the ghetto itself, or the, the part which is was uh, which was very long the ghetto is right over the Danube canal so it's it's in, it's in the second district it's a, a, it's like a very very short walk from from the first district but it's um, it's there um, yes so we let's see how safe for tourists would you consider Vienna uh, from a scale one to ten? 15 or 20, <laughs> it's really like safe. You can, everything can happen everywhere, really. It's a matter also of being aware of, uh, of dangers, but it's, uh, Vienna is really, really a safe, uh, a safe place. Um, so let's see which other question. Um, so when one takes a Danube river tour, does the tour follow the river and the canal? Do all of these uh, tours stop in Vienna? So there are like uh, the classical uh, river tour, Danube tour, you can start from the canals, so from the center, and it goes all the way towards uh, to the, to inside the main river and then back 
so it's making kind of like a circle. What also you can do is that you can take a speedboat, or there are also, I think, normal boats that goes from Vienna to Bratislava, which is the capital city of Slovakia. And Vienna and Bratislava are, are the two, uh, the two capital cities which are the closest one worldwide because it, it's about, um, uh, I think, 60 kilometers, which is again. 40 miles uh, or something like 30 something miles uh, so it is right kind of like uh, with a car like maybe 40 minutes so it's really close and you are and you can also go with the with the with the boat with the ship so it's uh, it's a uh, it's a nice excursion and if you stay a bit longer in Vienna to do like uh, to do like one day in Bratislava, uh, it's definitely uh, nice and also cheaper also <laughs> it's like this it's not always a bad thing um, just for your info, there is a wonderful small museum, the Third Man Museum near the Nashmart. Yes, uh, there is one. Uh, the, 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 if you, let's say, the, the question was like, for example, about the sound of music, if uh, the sound of music was the movie is that famous, in Vienna is definitely the Third Man, the movie that it's uh, characterizing the city. And there is this very nice museum. You can also do kind of like tours of the sewage system because part of the movie was, uh, was filmed there. So it's really, and I really suggest this movie. It's really like, it's an old one, black and white, I know can be kind of like, Think sounds heavy, but it's not. <laughs> um, so, where is the best place to where is the best place to stay along the ring? I would not stay. I mean, it depends how much money you have. <laughs> this is the question. If you want to stay along the ring, there are beautiful hotels. Uh, they are rather expensive. Uh, I personally prefer other areas which are more uh, maybe less. Uh, representative or like uh, imperial, but maybe more exciting because of you know daily life and little shops and coffees. And uh, but yes, it's, uh, that's just my 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 my, my opinion. Uh, is there a recommended tour such a bus such as Hop 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 On bus? Yes, there is. Uh, I think it's the same company that runs it everywhere, if not worldwide, at least in Europe. Um, it's an idea. Uh, my suggestion is also just to take uh, a, a tramway or a bus, but tramway is better and just go. And this is the cheapest way to do sightseeing in Vienna because everything is really like uh, kind of like not too far away. And, uh, and it's really nice to, to just enjoy. And you see also, you know, locals people, and it's also nice to, 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 to see that, to interact and to experience that. So it's just like uh, uh, just one, uh, one suggestion. And there are these uh, tramways that goes around the ring road. So it's perfect. Um, so doo -doo -doo. let's see. Um, um, OK, wait. Is there much resident residential space? Yes, there is a lot of residential space. I mean, a lot. They build, keep on building a special social housing. They try to keep up. Um, Vienna is also famous, uh, especially in the 20s, 1920s, 30s, for being uh, very uh, one of the first European cities, if not worldwide, to, to invest a lot in the social housing. So uh, it's. Um, uh, you can see a lot of very, if you are into architecture, there are great projects here, a bit older, but there is, uh, there is space. And the good thing is that the most of the buildings, uh, also a bit outside the city centers, are exactly the same elegant older buildings from the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So many apartments maybe are not the most modern one, but you can still live in an inside a, a great uh, a great historical building. Nothing about my favorite, di favorite dish, the schnitzel. Yes, true, I know, I know. Uh, but you know, it's like, I'm Italian. We have a long fight between Italy and Austria who invented it. So that's why I left it out, <laughs> no kidding. Um, I decided to stay more to the sweetest part of, of it. But of course, schnitzel is one of the, as well as also like uh, the different Würstel, the sausages that you can, uh, there are these great um, little kiosks uh, spread all over the city, which are called uh, uh, Würstelstand or yes, sausage kiosk, <laughs> let's say like this. And, uh, um, and uh, these are like, uh, um, 
yes, where you can find and buy it, uh, all the different kinds sold uh, also in the night. So, and uh, this is connected also to the question, is it expensive to live in Vienna? If you eat only the sausages, maybe not that much, but it's still quite expensive. Let's say it's, it's something in between. It's not being in Moscow or being in uh, New York or like it's still affordable. Uh, the, 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 the people also kind of like, if you work here, you earn a little bit more than uh, and then, uh, um, yes, then maybe in Italy and other countries. Still, you, it depends. It depends, of course, also what you want to do, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's affordable still, it's affordable. Uh, is it difficult to obtain tickets at the Opera House? Uh, what is the typical cost? The, the cost, I'm not sure to know. I don't know exactly. There are different seats, different tickets. What it's nice is that uh, there are also these uh, standing uh, tickets where you they cost. Back then, uh, I used to go when I was a bit younger, uh, they were like two, three euros. It was really nothing. With the, 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 the negative aspect is that you were had to stay and stand for about three, four hours. <laughs> so I don't know, it depends. I'm not sure I want to do it again, but uh, it's of course a, a, an option if, you, if you're in Vienna and these days you don't need to book them. You can, I think, just go, just show up there. When is the best time to, of the year to visit in person? I always suggest like spring, beginning of summer. In a normal year, I would not come here in August or so because there is not that much to do. Everything, as you can imagine, everyone is on holiday and everything is kind of closed. But like May, June, July, it's really nice. It can be, if the weather is, uh, is nice, it's really, really perfect time. Um, um, uh, are there any particularly good uh, or not well-known Vienna secession works around the city other than the secession building? The secession building I didn't show because it was, you know, it's also a matter of time and things and, um, but this is this beautiful uh, uh, example of this uh, or uh, manifest of the Viennese secession, which is the, the movement that were also Klimt, for example, Gustav Klimt was part of, uh, among others. There are many other uh, buildings also not, um, you know, uh, not far from there. Many of them are private also like um, uh, houses uh, which were built in that period or also like, for example, if you are into, for example, if into paintings, uh, definitely there are like some frescoes uh, in, the, in the art uh, history museum, for example, uh, there is, uh, there are also different churches spread all over. So it's kind of like if you are into that, you can, you can do a specific visit of Vienna. It can, you just, uh, it's a bit ups, outside, uh, so far away from the normal place, maybe you go you go with the uh, uh, with the uh, when if you come here two days or three. Um, uh, <laughs> this is a question I I don't know the answer, but I like to mention it. Uh, how did the Almdudler herbal drink come out? Come about? Is it popular with the locals too? I loved it when I tried it there. Hard to find in the U.S. Uh, the Almdudler is very much beloved. It's a herbal drink, soft drink. It's kind of like a natural cola in a way, let's say. I'm not the biggest fan, <laughs> but they have funny advertisement, I have to say. Uh, and I don't know how it came to this, but I will double check also for, for my own uh, knowledge. <laughs> you never know. Uh, do any descendants of the Habsburg family still reside in Austria and did they retain any of their wealth? How does the general population view them? Oh, uh, they do, they do. There are maybe, I think, around 600 people now, more or less, that are still uh, has this, this surname. Um, they did retain some of their uh, power, uh, some of the past. They are kind of like, of course, part, most of them, or some of them, is part of the high society of uh, Austria or Europe. They still as you can imagine, I mean, in Austria, you know, having a noble title doesn't bring you anything anymore, but still having one can bring something, let's say like this. And they, but there are, there are, they came back. It took quite long. It took uh, until the end uh, uh, of the 20th century before then officially the law that uh, was forbidding uh, the Habsburg to come back to Austria from the exile was, uh, was uh, stopped to exist. So they, they were allowed officially to come back. So, but they are. 
Uh, how ethnically, uh, ethnically and culturally diverse is Vienna or Austria now? Um, it depends where you are. I mean, in, in Vienna is, of course, Vienna is quite, uh, as I said, a melting pot of cultures. There are a lot, uh, are also like uh, second, third, fourth generation already, especially also from the Balkan regions, uh, which is right next to, to Austria or from Turkey. Uh, there are people about from everywhere. Vienna is uh, international. Is also the seat of, uh, of the UN, uh, Vienna is the seat is it's a very important institution offices so it's kind of like a very uh, it is an international town city of course the rest of Austria is, is different it's, it's, it's more countryside the cities are way smaller uh, there are for sure but it's not on the same uh, probably uh, amount uh, or like um, uh, so uh, what region is Austria, what region in Austria is most uh, famous probably of the wine girl. At the beginning of the tour, you had a photo, yes, of wine, uh, wine yards. Yes, um, even in Vienna, actually, there are wines and wine yards. Uh, there is this, uh, this uh, district which is called the Green Sink, and it's, uh, it's a bit on the outskirts, as you can imagine. Of the town, of the city, and there you can just uh, you go with this, for example, with a bus or a tramway, and then you have these places where they produce their own wine and they sell it, and you can eat. Very typical. So even Vienna has its own uh, wine yard. So it's just really like a, one of the few capital city worldwide with this kind of uh, uh, of, uh, of the production. But yes, the Danube, if you go especially towards uh, Germany, let's say, so not to the east but to the west, you. Have have the so-called Wachau, which is this region, the picture also you saw at the beginning, and that they have also very good wines and uh, food. So it's really like, uh, I think always Austria is a bit, um, is not too well known for their wine and food because they have very nice price. So it's like uh, just a little tip if you come here to try it. Um, so, uh, so this is a question, I don't know if I will try to answer without a picture. What is the dessert food that looks like broken up pieces of bread? I showed it in the dessert cake. Um, it is, uh, I think it was the, it's a, it's a complicated word, Kaiserschmarrn it's called. Uh, and it's uh, basically a pancake. Uh, which is then with raisins and uh, I don't know if plums also, but anyway, you, you you just then while you're doing it, you break it, you put also like sugar on it, so it's it's really nice. I don't do it that often, but <laughs> but I do I do like it when like I when I'm going to eat outside, I do like it. Um, so, are the Sacher Torte available in other bakeries too, or is it unique to the Hotel Sacher? This is also a, a good question because um, uh, it's a matter of copyright. Uh, the, there was a very long uh, process between the Hotel Sacher and another bakery in, in Vienna, it's called Demel, uh, because uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, Franz Sacher, the, 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 he was very young when he created this cake, at the beginning of the 19th century, he was actually working as an apprentice to this other in this other's bakery, Demel. So they still they had a very long process until they decided that the Sacher cake is uh, the copyright of the Hotel Sacher or the Sacher, yeah, business. And while all the other or the others, because it's not the only one that you can find, have uh, a different name, and anyway, the 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 the, the ingredients and the recipe and so it's everything is secret so uh, you cannot they don't know exactly how it's done um, what you can do is like if you you can definitely also order it online to buy it they have a very they have an online shop the Sakratov so if you if you want to try one you can you can uh, you can order it there also because you can buy it basically only in Austria uh, there are different shops around Austria in different cities but uh, uh, and only one uh, other shop which is outside Austria and is it in Italy in South Tyrol so close to the border but you can order them online I think they will ship it also to the US 
I uh, wonder why we didn't hear about Mozart. This is, uh, of course, a good question. I mean, of course, we could have, uh, I could have also talked about Mozart, but uh, I didn't talk about him just because he was uh, basically also um, from Salzburg. So he's, he, of course, he lived also in Vienna and he's a very, very important uh, uh, artist and composer that you cannot miss it when you come here, of course, but, um, but uh, you know, the time and everything, I couldn't uh, talk too much also. But he, he was from Salzburg, that's why I didn't talk too much. But we saw the monuments at least uh, at, the, at the Burggarten in the Imperial Palace. Um, so let's see, so many questions, it's crazy. <laughs> um, okay, wait, I have to read that just like... Um, uh, the newer roof of the St. Stephen's Church is amazing. You said it was uh, tiles, yes, they were like the ceramic tiles. Uh, does it need to be repaired often or is it sturdy? Uh, it doesn't have to be repaired often. The thing with this church is that uh, it's, um, it's, it's constantly under renovation. So it's the kind of like if they finish a part, they start the next one. Uh, especially, for example, for the facade, for the color, because uh, now it's the pedestrian area uh, since the 70s, 1970s, but until then was a normal street, so there were a lot of cars going, uh, so the smog and the pollution, and so everything is this constant cleaning, so it's like a never-ending story. It's like, but I think the, 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 the roof is it's okay, they, they rebuilt it anyway after the Second World War, so it's quite new, let's say. It's quite new. Um, okay. Uh, yes, let's see. It. Okay, this is about the thing. Uh, if they prized freedom, so the Habsburg, I guess, does that mean the culture was uh, tolerant of differences? If so, what was the appeal of the Nazis? Oh, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is a difficult question. I mean, I, 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 let's keep it very short, I guess. But um, uh, I mean, first of all, they, 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 I mean, the, the part of the question about the freedom or the acceptance of the culture was about was during the the Habsburg Empire. Um, the Habsburg Empire finished in 1918, and between 1918 and this, and the Hitler, the Second World War, there was something. There was a lot happening, even almost a civil war in the 30s. So the situation here was like in many other parts of Europe was not the easiest one. So. It's uh, Hitler back then was uh, kind of like uh, uh, in that period was also easy to kind of like um, uh, to to be for people to believe that he could change things in better. But uh, yes, it didn't happen. So uh, yes, it's not. Uh, yeah. um, Austria is a democracy, but is it quite socialist? Uh, socialistic. Uh, it, I mean, it is. It's like uh, it's a democracy. It's a republic. Uh, Vienna is definitely the most uh, one of the most uh, let's say socialist part of the of the city. It has always been uh, since the 1920s. So it's kind of like inside in our blood. But this is, has also to do with you know, as I said, this uh, very interracial uh, melting pot, uh, and it's kind of like part. It's it's kind of normal. Many times, big cities are a bit more tolerant and liberal than. I mean, like yeah, open to, but yes, it's it's it's, it's that they can we can say that it's like everywhere. Every country in Europe has its own <laughs> of both sides. Um, <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> I've heard the Habsburg Joe is famous, iconic. Is that so? Yes, it is. Uh, that's why I mentioned when I was talking at the beginning about the Philip the the handsome. He was not that handsome, but not because of him actually. But it's the thing is that back then. Uh, it was quite normal to uh, to uh, marry and to have children with your uh, cousin or with your I don't know uncle or whatever. It's just to keep you know to keep the royal blood uh, um, uh, in a way clean or still royal, so do not mix it with with someone who has not uh, royal blood. And this, as you can imagine, was not. Um, uh, was not the best choice to do and this was happened especially in the Spanish line so in the Spanish part of the Habsburg which uh, um, which then uh, by 1700 basically disappeared and this is also they say many stu many studies that it was also because of that uh, the, the, the the descendant of this part of the Habsburg were so also sick or like um, with so many problems that were also not able to to, to rule over over an empire like so it's uh, and this Joe, it's one of the 
it's one of the of the symbols of the Habsburg. It's not maybe the best symbol, but yes, it is. Um, uh, in Salzburg and Innsbruck are small bronze plaques. Uh, in the sidewalk, the noting. Uh, um, denoting that uh, uh, that where Jewish people were taken or were living during World War II. Uh, there is also in Vienna, there is everywhere, I think in Europe, I don't know in this, uh, I mean, I don't know if everywhere, but it was an artist, I don't remember his name, who started this project and it kind of like slowly spread all over Europe. And uh, it is, uh, um, it, it's something, it, 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 I, I really like it. It's, it's, uh, it's the thing is that many times now it's got so normal to have this plaque on the floor that you don't really see them. And it was more, uh, I think they are trying now to find other solution to, to, to let these places be more visible for the people, but yes. Um, yes, and then I would say the last question, uh, it's like, can you comment on Vienna being one of the most livable city in the world? Yes, it is. It's uh, since many years, the, the, the capital city with the highest uh, quality of life worldwide. Um, I kind of uh, trust, I, I mean, I, I trust that I live here, I, I can say it's true. Um, of course, uh, these kind of survey, surveys, they don't consider other parts, other aspects uh, of life, but, but still it's a safe place, a lot to do, it's affordable still, it's very clean, very, very clean. Uh, so it's, it's, it's great, for that it's, it's true, yes. So come and visit it, I hope you really uh, enjoyed it and I hope you, to see you here, to meet you here. I don't know when and how, but who knows? <laughs> And thank you, Mara, really, for this opportunity. It was, uh, it was just, uh, I'm very happy to be yeah, able to, to, to show it. Thank you so much. And thanks to the audience, because obviously without an audience, this would not be effective. So we really appreciate it. And um, we've learned so much tonight. So with that, I'm going to say good night. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Have a good night. We'll see you next week. Thank for you, everyone. Tour.